up in a very small village in, on top of Mount Kenya. And I looked at women struggling with nothing. But they have to do everything, from health to food to clothes to school for children. And I grew up thinking, I really do not want to be like that. I don't want to go through that. We started with small steps, baby steps, creating policies and procedures, convincing people that it's possible to lend to women because nobody wanted to lend to women. A male family member had to sign for you to be able to get a loan from a financial institution. My main uh, concern is poverty, from the beginning. So poverty itself is violence happening with the consent of the society. And all through my life, I have been uh, trying to uh, you know, combat with uh, poverty, that uh, what's the way to remove poverty in a sustainable way. It's the women who build the community. And it's the women who preserve the assets the heritage, the traditions. We need to recognize that. And if you don't, then uh, we will be you know, left with uh, hunger and with violence. Several people in several countries around the world roughly you know, 35 to 40 years ago started thinking about creative ways to take the, the social capital that the very poor might have and use it to replace the collateral or financial capital that they didn't necessarily have. Women's World Banking's history sort of dovetailed with that in, in kind of an interesting way. A group of women who met at the first UN Conference for Human Rights on Women in Mexico City in 1975 really started trying to make the link between human rights never being fully um, achievable or realizable for women if they did not have economic rights. If you really want to work for uh, poor women or poor, you know, you need to closely understand them. Since they are living on day-to-day -day basis, earning on day-to-day -day basis, they are also thinking on day-to-day -day basis. That made us think that let us start some kind of a financial literacy program. We have a special campaign on not spending much on marriages. And then we are seeing that uh, the older women, they're saying, you know, socially we have to do it. But then there are younger daughters, you know, saying that, can we change this? Instead of spending this money on, uh, on marriage, can, can't you spend that money? They're telling to their mothers, can't you spend that money on my, uh, my education? Let the women speak and let them be heard. At the same time, let their rights be known to them. When you look at finance, is it just? Financial justice. Do they understand that, you know, what they should be uh, paying for the loans that they are receiving? So these are some of the things that we are doing now. I believe that the future of microfinance is going to be embracing a broader set of products and making available at the right price point, in the right amount, um, products that we take for granted, insurance, pensions, available to the, uh, the lower income segment, but doing so in a way that the financial institutions offering them are able to make a living doing it. But if you're going to offer those more complex products that have concepts like premiums or, uh, or compound interest, you've got to have financial education. <laughs> I'll tell you the ultimate success is the fact that all mainstream banks, they are chasing women as their clients. We brought home the message, women are backable. That's what's so exciting about microfinance is that it, it, it allows people to think about a future. It allows people to have that hope. I am a firm believer in the capacity for financial products and services and the access to those financial products and services can have a positive impact.